Alrighty, so we finally got through all the content we needed to do for the wide column NoSQL databases, which means we're going to start moving into basically all the key value stores and the associated content with that. So in order to get started, we're going to talk about CRDTs or conflict-free replicated data types, and I'll just go ahead and jump into that right now. Okay, CRDTs, what are they? Well, basically, in a bunch of the database systems that I've talked about so far, aka Dynamo style, um, or you know things like Cassandra, where there's a bunch of possible leaders that writes can be sent to, and writes are going to be replicated in some sort of topology or ordering around those leaders, there's inevitably going to be write conflicts. Obviously, this comes at the trade-off of higher write throughput, which is great, but it's still extra things that we have to deal with and think about in order to kind of mitigate those write conflicts. As such, in the past few years, we've seen this new type of technology come around, which is called a conflict-free replicated data type, CRDT for short. And basically, all those do are, it's basically a piece of data that each database leader can keep internally that um, eventually can be sent from one database to the other. And, you know, upon merging, they can kind of converge to a consistent state between them. Obviously, CRDTs are super useful, and uh, if I had had one in my past relationship, maybe me and my ex would still be together because we could have used some sort of conflict resolution like that. Um, CRDTs can implement things like counters, sets, maps, and lists, and um, even for something like collaborative text editing, they can be really useful, especially as far as lists go. So that brings us to use cases mainly. So in terms of collaborative editing like Google Drive, Figma, Office 365, being able to create a uh, list of items that comes from a multi-leader replication setup is really useful and it's not something that's super easy. Um, there's a ton of challenges involved there and it's still a research topic that is very much um, ongoing. Um, you can also use an algorithm called operational transform for this type of thing, but that is a topic for another video. There's also online chat systems in terms of ensuring that the ordering of the chats is eventually going to be the same amongst all users. Uh, there's also anything that involves offline editing, like say a calendar app, eventually you're gonna have to sync those changes back into the database. And so in that sense, each offline client is kind of treated like its own database in a multi-leader replication setup. And then finally, um, CRDTs are now used in a decent amount of distributed key value stores such as RIAC and Redis. Since these are both things that I'll be talking about in subsequent videos, I wanted to first talk about CRDTs because they're a very important differentiator between these and something like Cassandra. Okay, so there are two main types of CRDTs. There's operation-based and state-based CRDTs. Operation-based is what it sounds like. Basically, you're going to be passing the operation from database to database. So basically for something like a counter, instead of passing an entire database's local counter from database to database, you'll simply pass the fact that um, there was an increment operation. What's important about this is that even though those operations may be commutative, as in it doesn't matter which one is executed first, so the order of them doesn't matter, they may not be item potent which means that if for some reason uh, the network goes ahead and duplicates the fact that a client tried to increment a counter, one database node might receive the fact that there were two increments when the other database node thinks there was only one increment. So it's important to make sure that these are deduplicated, which you can do via something like TCP, or maybe you could even just include an extra key uh, that acts um, as a way to ensure item potency. Uh, additionally, these are really good compared to state-based CRDTs when the state of whatever it is that we're transmitting or trying to keep track of is very large and expensive to kind of uh, transmit over the network. Um, even especially if there are very few operations relative to the size of the CRDT itself, again, operation-based CRDTs are probably the move here. Um, that being said, these two things are both equivalent mathematically, so it really kind of comes down to these trade-offs. Um, as far as state-based CRDTs go, for something like, say, a counter, for example, like I mentioned, you would be sending the entirety of the counter over from one node to another, and then the nodes, once they receive kind of those remote counters, would uh, be going ahead and merging in that state. 
Um, the merge function, it's very important that it's both commutative and idempotent. So even if you accidentally duplicate a merge, it has no effect, and a merge will go ahead and propagate all of the previous changes that a node has um, basically realized or seen in the past. In this sense, um, state-based CRDTs are pretty simple to reason about, but like I said, they can be kind of slow if you have a lot to transmit over the network. Finally, since um, gossip protocols deliver messages out of order, and since they are potentially duplicated, I've mentioned gossip protocols in a prior video on my channel, so feel free to look at that. Um, they work very well with state-based CRDTs for kind of exchanging all of this information. Okay, so now I'm gonna go through a few examples of CRDTs. I'm gonna go through the first one in a lot of depth, and then we'll quickly go through uh, the next couple to kind of see how you can grow those from the first example. Okay, so this is a grow-only counter, which is basically saying, we are going to have counters on every single database replica, which keep track of how many uh, increments they've received. And after merging uh, other information with other replicas, imagine there's some sort of anti-entropy process in the background that kind of exchanges information from one node to the other. What's gonna now happen is that the information is going to be eventually consistent and converging so that every node is somewhat up to date. So what's gonna happen is that each node in the database is gonna start off with an array of zeros. This insinuates that all the counters are at zero and that um, the reason in this case why we only have two elements in the list is there are two replicas. So now every single time that one of the replicas handles an increment operation, it's going to increment its own local counter. So that is its corresponding index in the list that it's holding. So as you can see, I'm uh, you know incrementing uh, replica one, or basically replica one is handling my increment. So it's going to increment the zeroth index of its list, which corresponds to it. Okay, client B is gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna be handled by replica two and that increment is going to happen five times. So now you can see that there's going to be five in that counter. So still, even though um, these two separate requests have been handled, uh, the two replicas have not synced up with one another yet. They're still eventually gonna converge, but right now they have yet to converge. So let's say I wanna query the counter value and the request is handled by replica one. Uh, it's gonna return one because it's just gonna sum up that local array. If I had that query handled by replica two, then it would actually return five. But eventually what's going to happen is that anti-entropy process, which runs in the background, or maybe it's a gossip protocol or something like that, but anything that transmits the information is going to go ahead and send that array from the second replica to the first. And what's going to happen is the first replica is going to say, okay, for every element in this list, I'm going to create a new array, which now represents my counter. And to get that new array, I'm simply going to take the maximum, so the element-wise maximum of each index. So now... Obviously, now we're going to have one five instead of the one zero that we had before. When the changes are propagated, propagated from replica one to replica two, we're going to call that merge function on replica two, and now they're both consistent and have one comma five as their counter. So what this basically means is that as far as each replica is aware, replica one has processed one increment request and replica two has processed five increment requests. So now if I were to go ahead and query either of them for the total counter value, all that's gonna happen is we're going to sum up this array and I'm going to get the value six. So they have converged. If I were to continue to make more increments on either replica, they would temporarily again be out of sync, but eventually they would come back to the same value and agree. That's kind of the point of a CRDT. So we've discussed the grow only counter, but what if I wanted a counter that could both be incremented and decremented? Well, if you remember from the previous diagram, what happened was that each replica kind of had a list showing how many increments uh, every single replica has processed as far as it's aware. So we're gonna now do the same thing, but one for all the increments and one array for all the decrements. And then to get the actual counter value from one replica, you're going to sum up the uh, increments array and then subtract the sum of the decrements array. And as far as the merge, seg uh, basically the merge function goes when uh, these replicas are synchronizing with one another, uh, you basically merge them in the same way as we did the increment array. So the increment arrays, we do the element-wise max, and the decrement array, we do the element-wise max as well. Um, I see that I wrote min here on the slide, but it's actually the element-wise max. So moving on to sets, uh, it's basically the same as the grow-only counter with the following adjustments. 
um, as opposed to using an increments and decrements list held on each replica. Now we're keeping track of two arrays, one for elements added and one for elements removed. So to get the set contents, basically we take all the elements in the added list and then we just don't count any element that appears in that removed set. And then as far as merging them goes, we basically just take the union of two added sets and the union of two removed sets. So as you can see, there's kind of this very similar process of just being able to have that um, commutative merge function, which is idempotent because the union with the set is obviously idempotent. And in the case of the counters, taking the maximum or the element wise maximum of two lists is obviously going to be idempotent. Um, so that's how sets would work. But as you can see, one of the issues with what I just expressed with sets is that once an element is in the remove array, it can no longer be in that set again. So how can we change this? Um, basically, to mitigate this, some variations have been created. One is every set in, or every element in the added and remove set has a timestamp, and then you would kind of use the timestamp to basically say, oh, if there's an element in the added array, but it has a more recent timestamp than the same element in the removed array, then actually the fact that that element was removed is not valid. We can say that that element was once again added. Additionally, another way of getting around this, because every time we use timestamps in distributed systems, we run the risk of dealing with unreliable clocks, is to just attach a unique tag to every single element in the, uh, the add set. And then you can go ahead and add that element tag tuple into the remove set as well. And if an element tag combination is only in the add set but not the remove set, then you can assume that that element is actually still in basically the merged set or the result of the CRDT. As far as sequence CRDTs go, and this is kind of what we might use for something like collaborative editing, I'm not going to touch too much into these just because they're pretty complicated and there are actually a lot of issues um, as far as trying to get them to work well and multiple different possible algorithms for getting them to do so. Um, it's something that I plan on discussing in a future video, but for now just know that the general kind of gist behind this is we're trying to get a list and doing so is really tough because when you're preserving order there are all these inserts into the middle of a list and it's really hard when you're trying to kind of make sure that the characters that you're inserting are not getting interleaved with the characters that someone else is inserting. So it's a pretty complicated thing, but I will 100% discuss it in a future video, along with Operational Transform, which I believe is the current algorithm that Google Docs uses for collaborative text editing. Okay, so in conclusion, CRDTs are super useful data structures to ensure convergence in a multi-leader database replication schema. Uh, they're generally used in conjunction with or with kind of like a similar design pattern to version vectors, which if you remember from my multi-leader replication video, is basically keeping track of the dependencies of every single write and using this to determine when two writes are concurrent or if they're not concurrent. Um, since this is a really differentiating feature of RIAC versus something like Cassandra, I figured it was really important to kind of understand how CRDTs actually work and give a few examples of them before actually looking at kind of the RIAC breakdown itself because I didn't want to just offhandedly mention CRDTs and then be like, oh yeah, RIAC has those. That wouldn't really be fair to you guys. So all in all, I hope this video was useful. Um, I look forward to getting back into the key value stores because then we're going to get to touch upon some more new things that are really important, um, like caching and cache consistency. And that's all going to come into play soon. So yeah, things are really coming together, guys. And uh, have a good day.